Romans 15, a call to Christian unity, and as hard as it is to believe, only five weeks left in our year on the Romans road. There have been a total of 44 sermons, in case you're interested, we continue our study of the transformed life by asking what does it mean to live as a Christian, and with that in mind, if you would stand in honor of God's word as I read verses 1 to 13, our text for this morning. The Word of God says, we who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy As it is written, therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again, it is said, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples extol him. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will come. Even he who arises to rule the Gentiles in hope, in him will the Gentiles hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. And Heavenly Father, we thank you for saving us from destruction. Lord Jesus, our sin was like grains of sand on the seashore, but where our sin abounded, your grace abounded all the more. And so we look to your cross for hope and peace. Holy Spirit, grant to us understanding as we open the precious word in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, church. Uh, You may recall that we are trudging through a large section on Christian quarreling. This morning we asked simply, does God care about our unity? It's a good place for an answer. (laughs) (laughs) Of course he does. Is our being unified within the church important? Yes. If so, how important? And how do we attain unity if we don't have it? And let's Just for a moment, and and we're going to be using our Bibles a lot today, okay? But let's take a quick stroll through the scriptures to see if we can answer those questions about the importance of unity. Psalm 133 says this, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. It is good and pleasant. And you may say, well, how good and pleasant in it? You want to know what it's like, the psalmist says? It's like the precious oil on the head, all right? Now, we don't often anoint each other with oil anymore. It's a practice that we don't use much in the New Testament church, except when people are sick that says, gather together the elders, anoint them with oil, which we do. But other than that, at celebrations and feasts and other things, we don't often do this anymore. But it used to be that oil was actually quite precious. It still is. It turns out entire wars are fought over it still to this day. But oil, olive oil at the time was quite precious. It was very expensive. And anytime somebody was going to be anointed or was going to fill a new office, say the office of priest, that priest was anointed with oil and they would take that very precious, very expensive olive oil. They pour it over his head. And so he says, it's like that precious oil on the head. It's running down on the beard. So they weren't using the oil sparingly, right? So much that it was actually going into his beard, onto the beard of Aaron. Aaron was the first high priest. It was Moses' brother. It's running down even onto the collar of his robes. It's just gushing out. That's what unity is like. Now, you want to know what it's like? He says, it's like the dew of Mount Hermon. Hermon was the tallest, highest mountain in Israel, still is today. You can go and visit there. We were there this last March, not far from Mount Hermon, where the Mount of Transfiguration is. It falls on the mountains of Zion. It's like water in a parched land. That's what unity is like. For there, he says, the Lord has commanded the blessing. You want to know what unity is like? It's like life forevermore. 
Unity among the people of God is like everlasting life. That's how it feels. It is good and pleasant. Jeremiah 32 says it this way, and they shall be my people and I will be their God and I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for their own good and for the good of their children after them. You want to know what unity is like? It's like God will give us one internal attitude. We will all think and feel the same way and then one external path of behavior. Not only will we think the same way, we will all want to do the same thing. Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 9, it says, For at that time I will change the speech of the peoples to a pure speech, that is one unified speech, that all of them may call upon the name of the Lord and serve him with one accord. Our text actually reflects that same language here in just a few verses. One voice and one accord. Into the New Testament church, there were two women in the church at Philippi who just couldn't get along. <laughs> Perhaps it was because of what their mothers named them. But <laughs> I entreat, he says, Eodia and Syntyche to agree in the Lord. You can imagine Pastor Paul here, right? The planter of the church at Philippi is writing in this only very small four chapter book on rejoicing and having joy in the Lord in all circumstances, even writing from prison. And who should make it into that four chapters? Can you imagine if there if it was so small, this is the inspired word of God. And the only time your name is ever mentioned it's because you can't get along with the woman who sits across the aisle from you at church. That's what he says. I am begging you. I'm entreating you. Please just agree in the Lord. I mean, it's like he boils it all the way down to the basest level. Certainly in the Lord, you have something to agree upon. Maybe you don't agree on anything else, but agree in the Lord. And then he says, yes, I ask you also. So this is now the leaders of the church true companion, help these women who labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement, the rest of my fellow co-workers whose names are written in the book of life. These were believing women who could not get along. And here Pastor Paul says, man, just get along. Get along in the Lord. The Lord has intended through the new covenant by the blood of Jesus to bring his people together as one people, Ephesians chapter 2 says that he might create in himself one new man, that is the church, in place of the two, that is Jews and Gentiles. So making peace, he might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. John chapter 10, Jesus himself speaking, he says, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. He's referring there to the Jews. I've got other sheep, Gentiles. I must bring them in also. They will listen to my voice. So there will be, what does it say? One flock, one shepherd. God's desire was to make fragmented Israel one people and one nation. God's desire was to make the two men, Jews and Gentiles, one man in the church. And his desire today is to make that one church unified. The way that the Lord himself is unified in the Trinity. In other words, the church is infighting if we cannot get along. The church's infighting would be as ridiculous and as counterproductive as infighting within the Trinity. Can you imagine? What if the Holy Spirit just rebelled? What if the Lord Jesus just said, ah, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. What if on that night that he was betrayed and crucified what if he had in his prayer to the father said if there is any other way let this cup pass from me and then not included the words nevertheless not my will but yours be done what if he had just said you know what i'm not doing it i'm not doing it what if there was a fracture in the trinity and here we have i believe reflected the attitude the pursuit of unity that we should have in the church the way that the Trinity is unified, so should the church be. And in case you're thinking that I'm stating that too strongly, allow me to make my argument from the scriptures. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1. I urge you, he says, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. For believers to walk in a manner that is worthy of our calling, to bear the name of Christ well, we must be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. 
The next verse, verse four, right after this one, talks about that there is one spirit. Then in verse five, there is one son. Then in verse six, there is one God and father of all. Be eager to maintain the unity in the church, just like there is one spirit, one son, one God, the Trinity. Jesus himself prayed for our unity. In John chapter 17, his high priestly prayer, he says, I pray for them that they may be one. He's referring to us, the church, even as we are one. The Trinity. That they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe the clearest proclamation of the gospel that we can give to a world which is so confounded and fractured, and our world is, is to maintain unity within our ranks. If we can speak and preach and sing with one voice, then the church will truly be a city on a hill. But if we cannot do that, our testimony will be just as quickly ruined. One pastor words it this way, he said, discord strikes a deadly blow at the work of God in the church. If you want to ruin the work of God at the church, begin to pick fights with your brothers and sisters in Christ. He says, if we can't present a united front, he says, then we cannot accomplish the work of God. Because after all, 2 Corinthians 5 says, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. Uh, and so the idea is that we are the ones who represent God to the lost and dying world, which means when they're watching us and our actions and our attitudes toward each other, they are assuming that is a reflection of the character of God. Our character reflects his character to the world. F.B. Meyer has worded it this way. The message of our lives should resemble the big advertisements, like billboards, the big advertisements which can easily be read on the billboards by all who pass by. The message of our lives that we are Christians should be easy to read. Ian e. Bounds, we are the Bibles that non-Christians read. We are the Bibles. We read these Bibles. Christians read these Bibles. Sinners read us, is what Ian e. Bounds is saying. And if we are to be accurate ambassadors of the kingdom, then we've got to imitate the king. Amen? Amen? If we want to become walking advertisements for the glory of God, then we must wear godly behavior. If we want to declare the excellencies of Christ, then we must live what we preach. And if there's one action which is more difficult to accomplish than any other, I think it is welcoming those with whom we disagree. If there's one thing that is harder for us to do than anything else in the church, it's just getting along with people we don't like, that we don't agree with, that we don't see eye to eye with. It's just swallowing that pride and saying, you know what, for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of the kingdom, I'm going to let it go. One action more difficult than any other would be declaring peace over those with whom we are at odds. It's declaring peace over those who have declared war against us. That's hard to do. It would be flying the flag of unity, even in the harshest winds. Because if unity is important to God, then it should be important to us. Amen? I'm going to give you this morning five attitudes. Five attitudes. If we are committed to unity. Five attitudes that the transformed Christian will adopt if they are committed to unity in the church. And the first is that they will regard others before they regard themselves. They will think about others first. They will prefer others before preferring themselves they will consider others. They will regard others before themselves. Look at verse one. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. The chapter division here between 14 and 15 is unfortunate. It is artificial. It is man-made, not God-made. Remember those chapters and verse demarcations are not inspired from God. We added those, people added those to make verses easier to find so that kids could have sword drills, okay? That is why those things exist. And so when you're reading Romans 14 into, verse, into chapter 15, remember there was no break there between these two verses. And the chapter break is kind of unfortunate since the argument that the apostle Paul began in chapter 14 and verse one, he continues here. And remember in chapter 14, there were only two conclusions that we can draw when it comes to Christian quarreling. Perhaps you remember from two Sundays ago. He says, 
We can either be willing to lay aside our own freedoms to swallow our pride, right? To fall on our own sword, to take off the boxing gloves. We're either willing to lay aside our own freedoms or we can agree that we are the weaker and less mature of the two in the fight. The mature person is willing to take off the boxing gloves. And he comes back to that argument here in verse one. The assumption that he makes in verse one is that we have all agreed to act like the more mature person. It's almost like he's saying, if you're still reading this, right? If you've not been offended to this point, if you're still reading this, then it probably means you have agreed to let your own rights go. If you have, then combined with considering your own freedoms in Christ as secondary, comes, he says in verse one, an obligation to bear with the failings of those brothers and sisters whom you are trying to honor with patient endurance. The word for bear there, the Greek word bastadzo, it means to carry. You're agreeing to actually carry the weaker brother. In modern vernacular, it would be like saying, put up with each other and pick up after each other. If you're saying, I'm willing to let my own rights go, what you're saying is, I'm willing to put up with you and I'm willing to pick up after you. It's the stronger helping the weaker by linking arms with them. When I and my sons are fishing, we will often, right, we wear waders so that we can get out into the river and all of that, but we will often cross or ford rivers that are bigger and and bigger maybe and deeper than we would have anticipated. The current is much stronger than we thought. And so we will link arms together as we go across, right? Uh, We call it putting ourselves in four-wheel drive, right? So we got to go into four-wheel drive and we will link. And especially when it's my youngest son, Chase, who still weighs the least of all of the Gardner boys, right? We'll link arms. And oftentimes if I'm fly fishing with another uh, man, a a man-sized person, right? One of my other sons or one of the guys here in the church will put Chase in between us. Because at 120 pounds, he's easily swept away. And so we'll put him between us. We will each lock arms over the top of him. And Chase will just reach out and grab the backs of our jackets, right? And so he's almost not even touching the, touching the ground. He's just scooting across. But we've got more feet now so that we won't slip. If one foot slips, we've still got four or five others touching the ground. And that's the, kind of the idea that he's giving us. Lock arms with each other. Put the church into four-wheel drive so that the weaker of you don't get swept away. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 2 says, Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Ray Stedman equates, equates it to crossing a rickety old bridge with someone who was afraid of heights. For some, that crossing poses poses no threat at all, fills them with no fear. Maybe you don't have a a fear of heights. You have no problem doing that. You don't mind taking that risk. But for others, the crossing of that rickety old bridge produces in them some panic. They might even get down on their hands and knees in order to just inch along. And the command is for the stronger of the two to lock arms with that weaker brother in order to ensure their safe passage. Even if it means personal sacrifice, even if it proves injurious, even if it may slow you down. He says, we have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak. Pick up in verse two. He says, let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. The principle which was stated negatively in verse one, bear with, here he states positively, please his neighbor. The law of love which we referenced last Sunday, is a general consideration of others over ourselves. And this law of love should govern our lives. Benevolence, compassion, thoughtfulness toward others, and a general disinterestedness in ourselves. Charles Hodge calls it a perfect disinterestedness. We should learn to become so interested in others that there is no room left for us to be interested in ourselves. You ever heard the saying that dogs will watch their owners, provide them with food and shelter and love, and so we'll think they must be God. Whereas cats watch their owners, provide them with food, shelter, and love, and so think 
I must be God, <laughs> right? <laughs> You've ever heard that before? Dog owners know that when they depart for work, their pet will walk them to the door, and when they arrive home from work, that same pet will be at the door tail wagging. Whereas cat owners understand that when they depart for work, their pets couldn't care less. When they arrive home from work, their cat is not interested. Perfectly disinterested means that when it comes to pleasing ourselves, we should be cats. Don't care. But when it comes to pleasing others, we should be like dogs, hanging on their every word, tail wagging. That's first. Second, if you're going to have an attitude committed to unity, not only will you regard others before yourselves, but notice second, you will rearrange your lives to follow the example of Christ and his word. Look at verse three. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. We need look no further than to Christ himself for an example of how to be perfectly disinterested. You may say, well, how does that look in everyday life? What does that look like? And so uh, take a walk with me again through the last few days of Christ's life. And notice how he was willing to bear with the apostles, how he was willing to please others rather than pleasing himself. Mark chapter 10 and verse 32 says it this way. They were on the road going up to Jerusalem. This is at the end of Christ's life. He's going up to Jerusalem to be crucified. And he knows exactly what's coming because look what he says. Jesus was walking ahead of the apostles and they were amazed. And those who followed were afraid. Taking the 12 apart again, he began to tell them what was going to happen to him saying, see, we are going up to Jerusalem. You can almost see it on the top of the hill. The son of man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise. Did Jesus have any confusion at all about what was coming? <laughs> no, he knew exactly what was coming. And he brings the 12 aside and he says, just so you know, this is the last time you will walk to Jerusalem with me. This is it. My life is over. I am going to get beaten and flogged and spit upon and crucified. That is coming. That's verse 34. Look at the next verse, verse 35. It is the next word. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said, hey, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. Can you imagine? He's just confessed all of these things. He says, this is what's coming. And James and John were so wrapped up in their own lives that they come and say, do for us whatever we ask. They had completely missed it. And nevertheless, his response to them is gracious. He was willing to bear with the failings of the weak. John chapter 20 and verse 24, Jesus has been crucified. He has been buried and now has risen from the dead. And Thomas, known more famously as what? Doubting. Doubting Thomas, one of the 12, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, right? They, they tell him everything. We've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails, place my hand into his side, I will never believe. And so eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas with, with, was with them, right? Not believing. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace with you. He said to Thomas, okay, Thomas, can you imagine bearing with the failings of the weak? This is the more mature, helping, linking arms with the less mature. Put your finger here. I heard that you wanted to poke your fingers into my side, <laughs> right? It's kind of a weird request. <laughs> Fine. Look at my hands. Now put out your hand. Place it in my side. Like poke it in the hole. Place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. In John chapter 13, in the upper room, the evening that Jesus was going to be betrayed. It says, during supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. In fact, Judas had already made his deal with the enemy's 
of Christ. He had already betrayed Jesus into the hands of the Jewish officials. That had already happened. Judas's pockets would have already been full with the 30 pieces of silver. He would have clinked when he walked. And nevertheless, Jesus knelt and washed his feet. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper, laid aside his outer garments, taking a towel, he tied it around his waist. He poured water into a basin, began to wash the disciples' feet to wipe them with the towel that he had wrapped around him. Right? He began to wash the disciples' feet. And Jesus Christ, who is infinitely above every other Christian, infinitely above you and I, and who would have been justified in seeking his own glory, was yet perfectly disinterested in himself, in his own agenda, in his own safety, in his own health, in his own security, in his own comfort, even in having his own way. Perfectly disinterested in himself and perfectly interested in the needs of others. Again, Charles Hodge has worded it this way, the sorrow which he felt was not on account of his own privations and injuries, but he had zeal for God's service which consumed him. It was the dishonor which was cast on God that broke his heart. In other words, Christ was more concerned with defending the honor of God than he was with defending himself. And so he was gracious, patient, loving, and kind toward those who were crucifying him. And even in the midst of that horrific act, he pleaded with his father for their forgiveness. In Luke 23 and verse 34, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do in the middle of being crucified. And the question we're asked in verse 3 that we're kind of confronted with is this, are you willing to follow the example of Christ who did not please himself but was willing to allow reproach which he did not deserve to fall upon him? He was willing to be wronged for the sake of God's glory. Are you? He was willing to forgive even of the most heinous crimes, are you? And none of us in this room have ever been crucified, I assume. None of us have been wronged to such a degree as was Christ, and yet Christ forgave. And the scriptures call on us to do the same. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 32 says, Be kind to one another, tender hearted. What is the next statement? forgiving one another. And as if that wasn't enough, he then adds this phrase, as God in Christ forgave you. And so you've got to ask, well, what has the Lord forgiven me of? Has anyone ever offended me as badly as I've offended the Lord? No. My offenses toward God are so much worse than anything's ever, anything anybody's ever done toward me. And yet God has forgiven me. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 13 states it similarly. It says, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus preaching in the Sermon on the Mount, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you yours. And maybe you're thinking, okay, I will forgive them as soon as they beg my forgiveness. <laughs> Come here and kneel before me and beg for my forgiveness and I will grant it because I am a benevolent person. Now that might be overstating it slightly, but I think there might be a kernel of truth in that sentiment. Maybe that resonates in our hearts at least a little bit. But consider this, forgiveness is not for their sake. In fact, forgiveness has very little to do with them. It's for your sake. And a refusal to forgive will eventually begin to rot your own soul. It will actually cause you more harm than it does them. I'm reminded of a lunch I had with Hallie's grandmother, Betty, Grandma Betty. Hallie and I took her to lunch on her 75th birthday. This was many years ago now. She's with the Lord. She just dropped. During lunch, she was so quick-witted and so funny and so wise. And this woman had been through it. She had been dealt a bum hand in terms of life circumstances. And she was just dropping pearls of wisdom. The whole time we're sitting there eating lunch, she was cracking jokes for a solid hour. One time she accidentally dropped her fork and the fork at this cafe, the, the silverware was very heavy, almost oversized silverware. 
She dropped her fork, which landed with a thud on the restaurant floor. Boom. Heavy enough and loud enough that people around us stopped talking. It was silent for a moment. She quickly said, oh dear, the diamond keeps falling out of my ring. <laughs> At one point, she closed her eyes to think. And then she said, you know, Danny, there are a lot of people in my life who I need to forgive. And not for their sake, but for mine. She said, besides, most of them are already dead. <laughs> I don't need to forgive them for their sake. They're already gone. I need to forgive them for my sake. If you want to take on this attitude of unity in the church, you've got to rearrange your life to follow the example of Christ and his word. But not only that, you've got to reflect God's glory above all else. Above all, look at verse 5. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In case the example of Christ and the external teaching of the scriptures were not enough, the apostle adds the internal influence of prayer. The truth of it is, apart from the work of God within us, there will be no unity among us. The apostle prays specifically that the Lord would grant the church at Rome to be of the same mind with each other, to agree in the Lord, to agree that it is the glory of God which counts more than any disputes between church members. And once we have that same mind, a mind that is disinterested in pleasing ourselves, who bears with the needs of others, who offers forgiveness freely, then it says we can praise the Lord with one voice. Our message will only be unified when our hearts are. Our gospel proclamation will only be unsullied when our testimonies are. Our worship will only be pure if we have no slander on our tongues. Our fellowship will be most effective when all of the arms in the church are linked. And so we must, and notice fourth, receive each other in the Lord. Verse 7, therefore, he says, because all of that is true, Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Receive one another. Welcome one another. That, that word for welcome carries with it the idea of taking a special interest in someone and drawing them close. And so also, we must be committed to taking special interest in others in the church and cultivating an atmosphere of acceptance. We are not in a position to draw lines where God has not drawn them. And if God has brought these brothers and sisters in Christ near, then so should we. That phrase at the, verse, at the end of verse 7, that phrase, for the glory of God, may actually be attached to both of its preceding statements. It could have read, welcome one another for the glory of God, the same way that Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. The same way that Christ treated you, he says, so also treat one another, receive one another. And then fifth and finally, if you want to have that attitude committed to unity, you've got to rejoice over the salvation of others. When God is doing a good thing in someone else, it should cause your own heart to leap for joy. I was thinking about Oklahoma this week. And I must confess that my thoughts do not often drift to the Sooner State. But I was reminded of the musical named after that state. When the man, whatever man it is, and I don't even know that I've seen the entire thing, which might be blasphemous to some. But when the man begins to sing, oh, what a beautiful morning, right? Oh, what a beautiful day. I've got a wonderful feeling. Everything's going my way. Why was it a beautiful day? Why did the soloist feel so wonderful? Because everything was going his way. But what about when things aren't going your way? Does that mean that it's not a wonderful day? Are we allowed to have days which are not wonderful? Days which have a shadow cast over them because of the circumstances of our life. Now, what about when there's strife and disunity and discord in our lives, in our homes, or in the family of God? Now, I hate to take 
theological issue with the musical Oklahoma, right? But did you know that there is a biblical version of that song? There's a biblical version of that song. It's found in Psalm 118. It's verse 24, and you probably sang it when you were a kid. Everybody gets to clapping like this. And then the person who's in charge says, This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Now we all sing together. Ready? This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. You know, the scriptures do not command us to rejoice only when things are wonderful. We are commanded to rejoice because the Lord is wonderful. We rejoice not because of what is happening to us, but because of what God is doing through us. Let me say that again. We rejoice not because of what is happening to us, but because of what God is doing through us. The author concludes the section by giving biblical illustrations of God's work among those who were considered outsiders, lost causes, and untouchable. Beginning with the Jewish people in verse 8 and then expanding it to all nations. And notice as we read, the rejoicing of the peoples because of their salvation Pay particular attention to all of the imperatives, okay? If you wanted to go all the way back to like 10th grade grammar where it was sentence diagramming and circle the noun and underline the verb and all of that stuff, look for the verbs. Look for the command verbs from verses 8 to 12. He says, I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs And in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. Here we go. We're going to start looking for imperatives. As it is written, therefore, I will do what? Praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing to your name. And again, it is said, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. And let all the peoples extol him. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will come. Even he who arises to rule the Gentiles in him will the Gentiles do what? Hope, praise, sing, rejoice, praise, extol, hope. Would those words accurately describe your life? Are you so rejoicing in what God is doing, not only in your own heart, but in the lives and hearts of others, that you're just not going to get bogged down in throwing mud at people in the church? If God can save the Jews, he says in verse 8, and then if God can save the Gentiles in verses 9 to 12, then he really can save anybody. And if he can save anybody, then he can save you and me, and this should give us hope. He ends with a benediction in verse 13 where he just prays this over the church where he says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. I love that he says, fill you with all joy. It means all possible joy. Every single possible way you can have joy, I pray that you would find it. God is the author of hope. He has provided it through the offspring of Jesse, Jesus himself. And if we regard others before ourselves, and if we will rearrange our lives to follow the example of Christ, if we will reflect God's glory above all else, if we will receive each other in the Lord and genuinely rejoice over the salvation of others, then through the power of the Holy Spirit, we will abound in unified hope. Allow me to pray. Lord, we would ask that you make us one as you are one in the power of Jesus' name and by his Holy Spirit who resides in every believer. Amen.